In the last two lectures, we explored the ways in which sedimentary rocks can be modified using observations to explain the principles of stratigraphy. These layers of sedimentary rock form most of the observable crust, and because of that, these rocks are evidence of the past. Remember that sedimentary rocks can hold fossils. These fossils can be the bodies of plants or animals, trace fossils like footsteps left behind, or even chemical traces of the past atmosphere. Because these rocks provide us all this evidence of the past, we call it the rock record. And I like to think of it as a book of Earth's history or Earth's personal journal. So if we think about sedimentary rocks at the surface of the Earth as being a journal, the last two videos describe the way the Earth writes in their journal. And I like to think of it this way because I'm an avid journal writer too. So what about when I go back and look at old journals? Well, I know that the older that they get, the more smudged or faded or even torn they can get. And I know that I personally have torn out a few pages here and there when I've wanted to erase things. So how does this translate to the rock record? Well, hold on, I'm about to tell you. But first, let's look at our familiar textbook figure of a sequence of sedimentary rocks. We've got our oldest sandstone, then limestone, two shale units, and lithifying sediment on top, and all of these are in an ocean basin. Now imagine that this tectonic plate is moving this way. It's going to collide with another tectonic plate, which is going to crumple it up a little, which will likely lead to the rock units bending up, and some of those will bend upward, some of them will bend downward, but the ones that bend upward are going to be exposed to the harsh conditions of the surface of the Earth. We know that at the surface, gravity is stronger, there are freezes and thaw events, and eventually these rocks start breaking up or weathering, and they get carried away from the rock units, leaving behind a flatter landscape. And we call this process erosion. But what is important here is that you understand that by and large, the rock record forms in basins and is erased at the surface of the earth. And we know that rocks exist above water level. I mean, we're standing or sitting somewhere dry on top of rocks right now. So we know that there is going to be gaps in the Earth's journal. Just like there were rules to recognizing the order of events in rocks that were formed in the rock record, we have rules for these breaks, too. Anytime this process occurs, which is deposition, uplift, and erosion, we lose journal entries. And in general, there are three kinds of ways to lose these journal entries in the rock record. There's angular unconformities, nonconformities, and disconformities. The first kind of unconformity I want you to be familiar with is called angular unconformities. And it's that next step in the sequence that we just looked at. There are two parts to understanding these types of features. First, they have a very distinctive appearance. And second, because of that distinctive appearance, we know that they have very distinctive histories. So let's go into those. First, the appearance. All right, the appearance of angular unconformities is pretty easy to recognize. You've got folded or tilted sedimentary rocks with younger flat-lying strata on top. So just like before, we have those same rock units, sandstone, limestone, and shale, but now they're bent upwards. And now we have horizontal layers of younger shale and sediments on top. Okay, so now the history. Oop, what happened here? Remember that sequence of events from before? Deposition, then uplift due to deformation, um, and then erosion? Well, that happens if the collision, or what do you think happens when the collision between the two plates ends and the pressure eases off? Well, that area returns to a depositional basin and more rocks are going to form using the principles of geology that we learned before. So when we see an angular unconformity, we can recognize it by its tilted rocks underlying horizontal rocks. And we can say that this area was once a basin, then it was deformed and uplifted, then it weathered and eroded, and then it returned to a basin again. All of that history from just six rocks. That's really cool, right? Okay, so angular unconformities are kind of, that's the easy one, all right? So are you ready for something a bit more challenging? I think so. But if you're worried, just don't worry, we're in this together. Okay, first things first, 
describe what you see. I'll start. I see an igneous intrusive rock here and some metamorphosed rock here. And then we have some limestone with broken up bits of that intrusive igneous rock in it and some of the metamorphic rock in it. And then we have more horizontal units above it. Now, there's also this line where the igneous and metamorphic rocks end and the sedimentary rocks begin. That line there is a non-conformity. And what do we think happened here? Well, pause the video and see if you can figure it out using the previous principles. Okay, now that you're back, let's see how you did. All right. So, the first thing right, was the igneous and metamorphic rocks. They, they're on the bottom, they came first, right? But which one was first first? Well, intrusive igneous rocks need something to intrude into. And so the first thing that happened here was that a rock unit was deposited. Okay, does that make sense so far? Then the magma intruded and metamorphosed it. Then the next thing that happened, right, if we are going up in the sequence, is that nonconformity. All right, and what do we know about angular unconformities, nonconformities, and disconformities? Right, there are times when these units were eroded away. So now we know that there's some gap in time right there. And uh, just to make things crystal clear, right, we can also see bits of those previous rocks that are broken up in the limestone, which of course formed when this area became a depositional basin again. Okay, so in geological terms, a nonconformity is when a magma chamber intrudes into the crust at the surface of the earth before the area sank below sea level. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay, so now for the last one, disconformities. Are you ready? It's a little trickier. Okay, here it is. What do we see? Okay, first we have our shale and sandstone. Then we have our disconformity, which is a non-parallel plane between the sandstone and the limestone on top. All of these units are parallel and horizontal and all of them are sedimentary. But there is this non-parallel transition. This non-parallel transition is where the erosion happened. Okay, so what we have here is a history where a depositional basin was uplifted above sea level, eroded, and then returned to sea level where deposition started back up. Okay, this video is running a little long, but I wanted to show you a really cool place in the US that I hope you will all visit someday and also has all three types of unconformities. It's the Grand Canyon. All right, pause here and see if you can find all three of those unconformities.